testimony of a lot of experts coming here today, you'll hear a lot of uh, expert testimony and uh, facts and figures that far superior, uh, they're far superior to what I can present. Uh, but I want to ex explain to you right now uh, my story um, because I think what we really need to do is look at the human element of Medicaid expansion and uh, I think this is what this is really all about. Um, like about 9,000 people in Missouri, I have multiple sclerosis. Uh, just to be clear, that's, uh, that's MS. Um, that's not muscular dystrophy or PMS, which uh, my girlfriend's mother insists I have. <laughs> uh, MS is a chronic uh, disease. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, an illness in which your white blood cells basically devour uh, the myelin sheath or the, the lining around your, your nerves and your brain and, and your spinal cord. Uh, and basically what that does is it, it varies from person to person and uh, uh, day to day even. Um, and uh, most people are, di are diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 50. Uh, and uh, two thirds of us uh, are, are women, but uh, it's, it's debilitating. It's actually uh, a federally recognized disability, but you just don't even know whether you're going to lose your balance, your ability to walk, your ability to see, your ability to even, as you can tell, listening to me, I'm sorry, it's, 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 it's difficult to, to, for me to speak to you as for you to listen to me, I'm sorry. It's, it's the words are in my head, uh, they somehow get lost between my head and my mouth, much like I get lost from here to the door. <laughs> uh, you, you lose many things. MS is, strips you of a lot of things. Uh, I am a 44-year-old uh, photographer and uh, writer. Uh, I spend most of my time rescuing cats. Uh, and I fall squarely in the gap, the Medicaid gap. And for me, it's becoming not just a gap, but a crevasse. And it is not just frightening, but terrifying. Um, six in 10 of us diagnosed with MS actually are forced out of the workforce within 10 years uh, by the disease, by the symptoms. And I made it six years. Uh, in late 2013, uh, I was forced out of, the, out of, out of my job uh, after uh, four hospitalizations in a month, in a couple months, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, due to, I, I, I lost the use of, temporarily, of my entire left arm. Uh, I lost, I was sitting in a restaurant and entirely lost my vision uh, for about uh, 20 minutes. I don't know if that was uh, just a bad restaurant or <laughs> just bad luck on my part, but uh, uh, the fatigue you feel is just extraordinarily horrible. You just, you get up in the morning and within three to four hours, you just can't uh, go on. Um, I am terrified. I don't know what to do. Uh, my unemployment is over. It, it, it ended last week. <laughs> um, I've gone on to Cobra. Cobra now doesn't even want to pay for my, med my MS meds. Uh, and to the, the average cost to pay for MS is about nearly $70,000 a year. I was, the first year uh, for Bright Flight in Missouri, I, I was on. Um, I never actually ended up making $70,000 a year, even though I was a professional. Um, but my medicine actually costs $60,000, $5,000 a month. Now, uh, an opponent 
of this bill was quoted today as saying, uh, you know, this isn't our problem. We don't need to, to pass this bill. Well, okay. Um, well, it's not exactly something that you can, chronic illness isn't something you can plan for. Uh, I've been working all my life and I still want to work, I really, really do. But, and I planned, I saved for a rainy day, I really did. But $5,000 a month in medical expenses just for a pill is not something that you can continue on your own. Um, you need some help, particularly once you can no longer work. Um, so, and particularly once, once you are unable to work, there's a two year gap between when, you, when your uh, employer funded healthcare ends and Medicaid begins. And uh, right now that's, that's, uh, that's pretty hard. October only lasts 18 months if it indeed will cover your medicine. So uh, for uh, all these reasons, I really urge uh, you to, to, to support this bill. Uh, if there are any other questions, any questions, I would be happy to answer any. Questions of this witness. Thank you for your testimony. You did just fine. You beat up on yourself a little bit there about your testimony. You did just fine. So thank you for taking the time to come here today. You did a good job. Thanks. It's failing me. Raise your hand again if you're a non-regular planning to testify. We've got one, two, three. Is there anybody behind the pillar? Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, with you I am moved by the testimony of the previous witness. I am Reverend John Bennett, Jefferson City, a retired minister of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and a board member with my friend Reverend Jim Hill of Missouri Faith Voices. We commend you for a serious attempt to address the plight of the medically needy in Missouri. We support the movement toward Medicaid expansion evident in House Bill 1901 and House Bill 1969 with the exception of the work requirement in uh, House Bill 1901, which would appear to penalize workers recently laid off, those who are searching for but unable to find a job, those with temporary health problems, and full-time college or university students, not to mention it would require a waiver of federal law. Beyond that, however, we have consistently advocated for full Medicaid expansion and thus would fully support Representative Kelly's House Bill 1239. It is our conviction that Medicaid expansion is a moral imperative rooted in the prophetic call to justice. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, said Amos. Jesus said, truly I tell you, just as you did it to the one of least of these, you did it to me. Informed and challenged by that truth, we believe that expanding basic health coverage to over 300,000 hardworking but low-income Missourians is the morally right thing to do. Likewise, expanding Medicaid <coughs> will have a transforming impact on the lives of over 100,000 uninsured children. My nine-year-old grandson has autism and is bipolar and is a special child of God. He faces great challenges in his life. Last year, he received a total of two months of therapy at the Edgewood Children's Center in St. Louis. His world-class therapeutic care by the Edgewood staff was covered by Medicaid, as is, his, as is his current therapy at Pathways. 
I rejoice in the way his tender, fragile, <coughs> and frequently disruptive life has been touched with loving care. My rejoicing is tempered, however, by the knowledge that there are hundreds, even thousands, of other dear children who desperately need that kind of care. Medicaid expansion would bring healing to their lives. It is therefore a moral imperative. A key point, Medicaid expansion, as has been indicated previously, will save lives. Families USA estimate that nearly 10 working age Missourians die each week due to lack of health coverage. That's deplorable. It is clear Medicaid expansion is a moral imperative. Medicaid expansion will save lives and it will bring healing and hope to the working poor. It's a moral imperative. I sense the spirit of the biblical prophets with us today, imploring us, all of us, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Biblical scholar Marcus Borg, in assessing Jesus' declaration of his mission to bring good news to the poor, liberation to the oppressed, and recovery of sight to the blind, a medical response, said that faithful to Jesus calls for a politics of compassion. A politics of compassion resulting in adequate health care for all Missourians is what we seek from the Missouri legislature, from this committee, of course. It is as simple and as profound as that politics of compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you for your testimony today. Further witnesses? Chairman Barnes and uh, committee members. My name is Joanna Hirsch and I'm a recent graduate from St. Louis University School of Law. Um, I've lived in St. Louis City for the last four years and plan to take the Missouri Bar in July and practice in the St. Louis area. <clears throat> for the past two years, law students at St. Louis University, including myself, have been working with Missouri Healthcare for All to collect stories of Missouri's uninsured. In this capacity, my classmates and I have time and again heard the troubling and heart-wrenching stories of many of these individuals in Missouri. People that fall within the Medicaid gap. Stories of hard-working people struggling to get by. In particular, my life and perspective on these individuals drastically changed when I spoke with Crystal, a St. Louis resident, in February 2014. I share her story with you today. Crystal is a young, single mother at the age of 28 with significant health conditions. She had leukemia at a young, at a young age um, as a teenager, and she received cancer treatment for two years in the late 90s when she was uh, covered by CHIP. She's currently working full time and has done so for the last seven years as a cook at Burger King in St. Louis. She does this while she cares for two small children, two young boys ages six and seven. Because Crystal receives hourly wages, she is not covered by her employer for health, health coverage. Even though she's been a loyal, hardworking uh, employee for the last seven years, and to date has never missed a single day that she's been scheduled to work. Um, since her youngest son was born six years ago, she has never been back to the doctor. When she was diagnosed with cancer as a teenager, uh, the chemo chemotherapy affected her heart function, and she was advised by her doctor to receive annual heart tests. To date, she's never received that heart test because she cannot afford it. Um, in Crystal's words, she told me, every penny I, use, I earn is used to support my two young boys, which has made it virtually impossible for Crystal to receive the health coverage she needs to live. She told me when I spoke to her in February that when I was first diagnosed with leukemia, my symptoms started as bruising. That's how she realized that something was wrong. <coughs> What scares me is I constantly have bruising. In fact, every morning I wake up with a new bruise. 
Although she's been in remission since 2000, so a little over 14 years, Crystal has constant worries every day that she either has cancer or that our cancer will come back and ultimately kill her. She lives with a never-ending fear that she will not live to see her two young boys grow up and live productive lives. Having insurance through Medicaid would allow Crystal, in her own words, to not wake up every day worried that I was going to die. I'm here to support Medicaid expansion to include all adults ages 19 through 64 with income up to 138% of the federal poverty line. So that hardworking Missourians, such as Crystal, can get the health coverage they so desperately need to live productive lives. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there questions of this witness seeing none? Thank you for taking you. the time to be here today. Further witnesses who are non regulars? I, actually, I should change that. This should be witnesses who are regular people. <laughs> and that is me. So I'll begin. Okay. I'm Leanne Peace, and I'm the director of the Missouri Kidney Program, and I'm here to represent the chronically ill uh, Missourians who have kidney failure. There are 11,000 Missourians who are on chronic kidney disease and requiring dialysis or maintenance life, or have gotten a kidney transplant. And so these uh, residents have a very expensive, very life-saving treatment they have to undergo. But before they, their kidneys fail, one in nine Missourians are at risk for kidney failure. So that's several of us just here in this room. We're at risk for kidney failure because we have diabetes, hypertension, um, we may have a, a risk of obesity in the elderly population. Minorities also have a higher risk of kidney disease. So that, that really is our state. One in nine Missourians are facing chronic kidney disease. But there, the good news is there's ways to prevent it and delay the progression. But that requires um, routine diabetic medicines, routine blood pressure medicines, and so I'm here today to support what the doctor spoke earlier of a diabetic medicine or blood pressure medicine that costs 60 or $75 a month is cost effective. So if we're not looking at the moral story or um, the religious views of the citizens, just looking at the financial piece, it's important to focus on a doctor's appointment and paying medications will delay the progression of a very expensive, life-threatening disease. Most of the clients I've seen in 25 years, they don't want to be sick, they want to keep working, they don't want disability, but now when the resources hit and they finally get assistance, it's when their kidneys totally fell. So we are unfortunately helping people with the very expensive amputations, um, vision loss, uh, kidney transplant, many things that are on the end of things. All of us want to look upstream, that's the only effective way to go, and it's to provide people with regular doctor visits, where they can see a nutritionist, where they can get their medicines, and that's every month. None of this stop and start things, that, there's nothing about the coordination of care with a Medicaid spin down that helps people with chronic illness. That's stopping and starting. And even some people can get help with um, you know, drug assistance programs for only a month or two, and that does not help with long term. So I'm here today to support true Medicaid expansion in House Bill 1239, and there's aspects of the other bills that I'm supporting too. I will say that I have a, um, a niece that lives in Arkansas, and so she was excited. She has been epileptic her whole life, and she has a young child, she's a single mother, so she was excited about being able to get in insurance through the Medic Arkansas program, but when she looked into it, even though it started at 100% of federal poverty, so she's working poor, when she came down to it, the insurance that came available to her was still not cost effective. Her medicines are expensive, she has several medicines paying for the doctors, it was gonna be on every month at least $74, and for her that was unattainable. So, that's why sometimes when we look at bringing insurance down to 100% and, and private insurance lower, there's still co-pays, there's still deductibles, and these medicines are expensive, they're the higher tier. A dialysis patient is on 20 different medicines. 
These are not the four dollar Walmart medicines, unfortunately. I also wanted to share with you, and I did email this to you, that just came out of the American, um, Amer the Journal of American Society of Nephrology, and uh, it quotes that the states that expanded Medicaid or have a broader coverage of Medi Medicaid, so they didn't expand, is over the years, those states that have the broader cover of Medi Medicaid have lower incidence of end-stage renal disease. So we know it works as far as access, getting access to doctors, getting treatment. Um, on Thursday, we're going to have Kidney Day at the Capitol. So I hope that you will be visited by some of the folks that work with this every day, some of your constituents that really need uh, to hear your voice about how important this is on their behalf. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Further, regular, well-adjusted people. <laughs> I took the bill. Hi, my name is Tally Lindemann. I grew up in St. Louis, and right now I'm a student at St. Louis University School of Law and also School of Public Health. Uh, like my colleague Joanna, who spoke a little bit ago, uh, I'm part of a group that has been interviewing people about their experience with healthcare. It's part of an effort to collect the stories of people who need better health coverage and especially to find out who are the people that have no coverage at all. Many of these people work either part-time or they work full-time for a small employer who doesn't offer insurance. They have low incomes, but they're ineligible for Medicaid. These stories that I've heard, they're difficult to hear. They're people who are living with constant worry, wondering if their symptoms are serious, or knowing that their symptoms are serious, but knowing they're unable to afford prescribed treatment. So there's many stories, but I'd like to especially share with you um, the story of Shannon and John. And you know Representative Kelly mentions a waitress with two kids. Well, Shannon is a waitress with two children, but she's not a single mother, she's married. She's married to a veteran, and right now her husband is living out of state in order to uh, study aviation mechanics. So a lot of the time she's on her own. So like I said, John is a veteran who served our country in Iraq. And although John can get medical care from the VA hospitals, he needs actual insurance coverage. And his wife, Shannon, does too. I said she works at a restaurant and she volunteers with the Boy Scouts for her sons. She needs treatment for a lung condition. She tends to get infections. She's at high risk for pneumonia. But her family can't afford the inhalers and the medication that she needs. Shannon told me that she worries because she watched her own father suffer and eventually die of the same condition. She told me that it was awful to see him on oxygen for three years before he died. But my medications cost four or $500 a month. If I got them all, I couldn't pay for gas or electric or food. So I go without some of them, but it worries me. Shanna's husband, John, spoke to me as well. And I was really touched by the love and concern that he showed for his wife. He proudly told me about how she supports the Boy Scouts and how they used to coach sports together. He told me, my wife works hard, but she used to be more active. If she could get good health care, she'd be more productive and she'd do even more for our family if she could be healthy. John also needs better coverage. He hurt his back while helping a neighbor. Since he couldn't make it to a VA hospital, he now has hundreds of dollars in medical bills from the local ER. After 21 years of service, as I said, John is studying aviation mechanics, so he's temporarily away from home. He can't be there to help <coughs> Shannon on the days that she is sick. He's worried, and he thinks that their family deserves better. It's on behalf of this family and others like them that I'm here today in support of extending Medicaid to all those with incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty line. Thank you for your testimony today. Thanks for making the trip here to Jefferson City. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Father Gerald Kleba. I'm the pastor of St. Cronin's Church in the heart of the city of St. Louis. I've been a priest 
for 47 years and for 35 of those years have served in some of the poorer neighborhoods of the St. Louis community. <clears throat> uh, now, seldom do I get to do this, so really listen up about this. I've been asked by the Missouri Catholic Conference to remind you how supportive they are of this, and seldom do four bishops across the state ever ask me to say anything. For now. <laughs> and so I, I would have driven 150 miles this morning just to have this privilege. And uh, I'm not going to uh, talk to you about money or the Chamber of Commerce because I'm sure that the Chamber of Commerce has a former senator who's talked to you about that already. Uh, I do know something about sickness. I've had four stage lung cancer and was told several times at the uh, Sight and Cancer Center that I'm incurable. But to this point, I'm here. But I have health insurance that's so enviable that I'm sure it surpasses the insurance of 95% of the people in this room. But had I to worry about the bills or whether I could go for appointments or go for treatments, I wouldn't be here. Be because, because that kind of stress in itself is deleterious to your health, and if you're sick already, it can be killing. I would just like to, to kind of paint a broader picture because we've heard so many moving stories that are first-hand accounts, but, but I'd like us to uh, uh, think back to that movie that probably everyone's seen called It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people saw that, I bet, but it's awesome. You know, and in the movie, uh, George Bailey's wondering whether his life was worthwhile and is thinking about suicide because his little savings and loans about to go under. And in his nightmare of that situation, he sees Bedford Falls as just one gloomy place with all of his old friends kind of skeletons wandering around and the whole community turned into a dustbin of nothingness and crime. And, and George Bailey wakes up and decides <coughs> to give his life a second chance and face up to whether he's going to be closed up or not. And all of the little people he helped over the years are lined up to support him, to make up the $8,000 that were lost, and to get everything running smoothly, and, and to be a happy community. And, and I believe that when we invest in people's health, we invest in their happiness, that happier families stay together, that happier children do better in school, that happier employees are less absent from work and do 110% for their wages. And, and we create a community of pride and dignity and compassion and togetherness. And I think that's what we want to be in the state of Missouri. Uh, so so uh, I'll just quote one scripture to you because we've heard some of that already, but in the book of Deuteronomy it says, I place before you life and prosperity or death and destruction. Choose life and it will be a blessing for you and your children. And I'm sure if the Lord High God were here right now, the Lord High God would say, I place before you Medicaid and prosperity or death and destruction. Choose Medicaid, it'll be a blessing for you and your children. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here and for speaking on behalf of Missouri bishops. It was my pleasure. <laughs> Further, further ordinary, well-adjusted. <laughs> Seeing none.
Now um, can I can we get a show of hands on just planning on this one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um Mr. Fajan, I don't think you're gonna take twenty minutes.